Um, <coughs> if you have a collection of ancient documents, anyone know what that is? What do we call that these days? Call it a Bible. It's a collection of ancient historical documents that we slap together between two bits of leather. We call it a Bible, but uh, I don't like calling it a Bible. It just makes it sound like the biggest selling book of all time. It's way more than that. Uh, written over 1,600 years by 20 something different authors on three different continents from dungeons and all kinds of different places. And God kept it all together for us so that we could uh, hear about the story of Jesus, understand the character, nature, and will of God, purposes of God, and so on. So if you have one of those, Turn very quickly to Acts chapter 3, verse 19 for me. <laughs> We've been speaking for a, 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 a sort of few weeks now. I've been away for the last couple of weeks. But we have been talking about um, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts 3.19 says, uh, this is Peter's uh, 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 message to the crowds. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And we've been looking at this whole idea of, of that, that word times of refreshing literally means, it comes from the root Greek word that means to get your breath back. So I want you to imagine you've been running a, a marathon or something, you're running hard, you're, you're boxing, you're fighting, whatever, and you just need to stop and you just need to get your breath back. Anyone ever have those seasons of life? You just feel like life is crazy, it's out of control, everything's happening, and you just want to, you just want to stop and you just want to be still, and you just want to get your breath back. Anyone ever go through those moments? Three of us, the rest of you, you need to pray for us because uh, you're way more better than we are at balancing life and everything like that. I need those moments in my life where I need to stop. And, and, and what Peter's saying here is that those times of refreshing, that, that one of the things that the Holy Spirit, the presence of God that's with us right now on planet Earth, the presence of God with us is, is in the form of the Holy Spirit. Right? Amen. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to go, I'm going to make sure that the presence of God stays in the form and, and presence of the Holy Spirit in a different way than what previously and so on, where the Spirit would come upon prophets, priests and kings for, for roles or tasks, but then the Spirit of God could be removed and taken away. Uh, Jesus said, that's, we're going to change that, and when I go up there, the Spirit's going to come, and Joel prophesied, your men servants and your maid servants, old, the young, you are all going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So you will have, if you are in this room today, you have repented of your sins, you've turned your life around, you're following after Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the promise of God. <clears throat> and one of the things that, that Peter said, when that Spirit, when the presence of God comes into us, one of the things that the Holy Spirit will do is he'll help us get our breath back. He'll help us get our breath back. You ever wonder? Anyone ever read those things like Jesus would say these things like, um, um, take my yoke upon you, it's easy and light. And then you become a Christian, and you went, as <laughs> if. What was he talking about? You ever have the, Jesus said, you know, I'll give you peace, peace that, 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 that's not like the peace of the world, it won't come and go, and you're like, whatever. But yet, it's actually true. Jesus did say that, and, and God does want us to have that uh, capacity and ability to stop and get our breath back and to slow down and to live every day understanding that we have the presence of God with us. I know you've got rubbish and junk and all sorts of things going on in your life. I know that, and so do I. But when I, when I stop... And I quiet myself and I remind myself that I actually have the presence of God. The one that said, let there be and there was. That, 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 that God has deposited himself in his spirit inside of me. And he walks with me and he's with me all the time. On the highest of mountaintops, in the deepest of valleys, God is with me. And God is with you, amen? God is with you. It's amazing. If, if, if we could just, I'm a big believer, if we could just get that as not just a a, a verse on a page or a concept in our brains or something we intellectually assent and believe, if we could get that truth into our hearts, how different would our lives be? How much more would we find the space and the time and the capacity and the ability to stop and actually just get our breath back? Yeah, we were watching the, the football last night and Jackie was saying to me, the NRL, and she was saying every time they, they score a try, the teams get in a huddle and they, they do this... And every team does it now. It's, it's a scientific thing that, that they stop and they, they, they take a deep breath. And what they're doing is it just helps them recalibrate. It helps them get focused. The adrenaline goes down and they just get a chance to reset. And, and, and that's what I think Peter's saying here, that the presence of God, there's something about the presence of the Spirit in our life that gives us the capacity to just kind of reset and, and be still and, 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 and to, to cope and to deal with and to resist and to stand and to run and to stop and to do those things that we <clears throat> need to do. So we've been kind of bouncing off that scripture and talking about the importance of the presence of God in our lives through the, the uh, person of the Holy Spirit. 
And there are three things in the, these ancient documents that we know we're told not to do with the Holy Spirit. We're told don't grieve the Spirit, don't quench the Spirit, and we're told don't resist the Spirit. So we spent some time a few weeks ago and we looked at uh, a grieving the Spirit. And the context with which Paul talks about grieving the Spirit is uh, to do with recognizing the body of Christ. And, and we grieve the Holy Spirit when we fail to recognize our brothers and our sisters. We grieve the Spirit when we, when we make choices to judge and to criticize. Uh, uh, we, we're all aware of what goes on in the news and we hear this about that pastor and this about that and so on. And a lot of it, yep, it's bad press. And a lot of it, if you read the stories, you go, yep, I think that was really dumb and stupid. And how could that happen? and so on, and yes, the ramifications of that mean that even though I'm not that person, I'm still a pastor, for example, so everyone thinks I'm like that guy, and you still are a Christian, so everyone thinks you're like that guy, and, and so on. So yes, that's all real, but yet we're still brothers and we're still sisters, and there's a, a, a place where Paul talks about uh, not, not, not uh, 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 grieving the Spirit by failing to discern the fact that yet we're all different, yet we're all one body. So let's not be people that throw darts at each other and and, and shoot each other in the body of Christ, especially when we don't know the whole story. We live in a day and an age where, uh, let me just, if, if this is not revelation to you, let it be. The newspaper doesn't always tell you the whole story. Oh, shock horror. Some people are just, your world's been shattered by that one truth. The media don't always tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So we talked about grieving the spirit, and then we moved on to a couple of weeks ago, we looked at quenching the spirit. But when people think of quenching the Spirit, they generally think of, of stopping the Holy Spirit from putting on some sort of public performance, don't they? It's, it's all, you're not, you come on a Sunday morning as if the only time the Holy Spirit wants to do anything is for an hour on a Sunday. And that's just ludicrous. Because most of what we read in the first 30 years of the history of the church, this ancient document we call Acts, most of that takes place outside the doors of a, a church. It takes place outside in the streets and the highways and the byways and the villages and so on. It takes place in real life. Not, not just in the context of some little spiritual meeting. So we started looking at quenching the Spirit, and we focused on the aspect of quenching the, the private work of the Holy Spirit in your own life. You can quench what the Holy Spirit is doing inside your own heart and inside your own life by not responding to the promptings and the, the, the directions of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit begins to speak to you about something. Maybe an area of your world. Maybe he begins to speak to you about apologizing to somebody or begins to speak to you about, about not you know, putting some boundaries and not sort of looking at that thing or not putting yourself in that position or, or maybe the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you about being generous or giving more or whatever it might be. And, and, and we, we kind of justify why we don't and so on and we, we, we resist, we quench that flame of the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in our own hearts. The first port of call of quenching the Spirit is not about Sunday morning, oh you quench the Spirit because that person wanted to prophesy and you didn't let them or that person go and you stopped, that, that, that's just not necessarily what you're going to find in this collection of ancient documents. I'm not saying that doesn't happen but what I'm saying is the first question I'm asking myself uh, w when it comes to quenching the Spirit, the first port of call for me is am I quenching what the Holy Spirit wants to do in my own heart? It's interesting that when Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit coming, just about everything Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would do, it was inside the heart of an individual, wasn't it? He's going to live inside you. I'm going to guide you into all truth. I'm going to take what is mine and make it known to you. I'm going to, I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to uh, glorify Christ in you. It, it, it just seems to me that somewhere along the line, we've gotten, uh, we, we, we get disappointed and sad. We think the Holy Spirit didn't turn up because someone didn't get a goosebump, fall over or break out in some prophetic tongue utterance or something. And we go, oh, the Spirit wasn't there. Well, hang on a second. How many people know that God is doing things in your own heart? There are people in this room, and we've talked about this a few weeks ago, and they're feeling more and more hunger for the presence of God in their own world. Well, the devil's not doing that, and the world's not doing that. That's the work of the Spirit. They're wanting to pray more. That's not the devil, and it's not the world. It's the Spirit. So when you get a community of people, and, and you start to see that there's something going on in the hearts of people where they're becoming more affectionate towards God, more hungry for the things of God, and so on, you look at that, and you go, well, now that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced that there's something going on that the Holy Spirit's doing something in this place. Just gentle breezes blowing of the Holy Spirit. And so we've been talking a bit about uh, things that we don't want to do to stop that, the grieving and the quenching and the resisting. This week I want to go another step further and talk about quenching the Spirit, but in a, a very different way, a more specific way that we can potentially tie to what Paul was actually trying to get at when he mentioned this, do not quench the Spirit to the Thessalonian church. Uh, if you can turn with me to First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 16 to 22. You ever 
been uh, at home maybe and your children, you, you're about to go, the taxis come and your bags are packed and so on and you're sitting down and you, maybe you're running through the rules with the kids, you know, so, so listen, you've got to make sure that you do your homework, right? <coughs> now that means no TV on, I don't want you sitting in the lounge room, I want you in your room, I want you to, and I want the, the and then the taxi comes and you've still got about 50 things you want to say and so you go, oh, and by the way, and da and da da and da and you just rattle off all this stuff and you, just to get it out. You, you were able to unpack and explain the previous 10 things you had to say, but the next 30 you ran out of time, so you just threw them out and hoped that they can process and think about that. Anyone ever, ever done that in a meeting or a, a situation? You just get out of there and you don't get a chance to explain everything. I do it quite often on Sunday. I spend so much time at the start of my message and then I get to the end, I just go, bruh, 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 bruh. hope you can pick it up. Well, this is kind of what's happening at the end of the Thessalonian letter. It looks like Paul's spending a lot of time, and he's unpacking this point, unpacking that. Then he gets to verse 16 to 22, just before his final conclusion, his ending, his exhortation, and he just seems to throw these things out. And it goes like this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. It's almost like there's these two kind of ideas. One goes before this verse, do not quench the spirit. And it's the idea of prayer and thankfulness and gratefulness and so on. Then there's another one at the back end of it, in front of it, that's really about this thing that we call prophecy and how we manage and deal with the prophetic. The truth is that theologians and so on, nobody knows exactly where does this verse, what side of the ledger, does it connect on the previous three verses or does it really connect to the other three verses on the other side, we don't really know. My theory is this. I think that it probably has a place in the middle because it connects to both of them. It connects to both of those things. What I want to do this morning is just in the time we've got, unpack a little bit about moving forward and how quenching the Spirit has somehow, Paul's saying that we can quench the Spirit somehow in our relation to how we handle the prophetic and how we handle prophecy. So I just want to talk a little bit about that this morning. So if we cut the back three verses off, it reads like this. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. That word quench it literally means to, to, to put out a fire. I want you to imagine a fire and, and, and that fire is raging and that fire wants to take on a life and, and, and bring warmth and, and light and everything like that. But somebody walks up and deliberately, through a deliberate act, pours water or puts a blanket over that thing and extinguishes. That's what this word quench means. It means to put out, like putting out a fire. Um, now, if you go back and you look at what's going on in the uh, Thessalonian situation, what we know from the first and second letters that Paul wrote is this. Somewhere along the line, somebody had gone into the Thessalonian church and had told them that the Lord Jesus has already returned. Anyone ever, anyone ever fall for that? You know, the, the, over the years, as long as I've been a believer anyway, I came to faith at 19, there's been countless times where people said, the Lord will return on this day, and he didn't. And he's going to come on this day, and he didn't, and so on. Uh, well, these guys were being told, no, it's not, he's not coming that day. He's already come, and you, and you missed the boat. Can you imagine what that must feel like, being a believer, putting your faith and life in Jesus Christ, especially in a culture where some of these guys were, where there was persecution, and it wasn't sexy to follow Jesus at all. It wasn't going to benefit you. And then somebody comes along and tells you by the Spirit of God prophetically, oh, the Lord Jesus has already come. You're going to feel pretty bummed, aren't you? You're going to feel pretty bad. And you're probably going to have a really bad taste in your mouth for anything to do with this apparent prophetic or these prophets or whatever that whole thing is. You're probably not going to be warm and open to that. You're probably going to want very little to do with that. I remember one night I'd just gotten saved in living in Ballina and I moved in with a Uniting Church minister and his wife. They asked me, why don't you come and live with us and experience what it's like to be in a family and we'll sit down and have meals and all these weird things that I never did in my growing up years. And I remember waking up, I got a job at Sunny Brand Chickens in Byron Bay. Anyone remember Sunny Brand Chickens? Any locals? Yep, I used to work at Sunny Brand Chickens. I was what they called an advanced prepared chicken handler, which meant I cut bones out of dead chickens. It was just a fancy title, advanced prepared chicken handler. And so I remember I used to get up <coughs> early in the morning, about 4 o'clock, have to get ready, and, and I'd be crying in tears because I hated getting out of bed in the morning. I'm not early. Person. But I used to have to get up and so on. And one night I'm laying in this little garden shed that, that, that um, the, the, the pastor had, had taken his garden tools out and put a bed in there, and I slept in this little garden shed. And I woke up and I looked across at my clock and the power was out. The, um, the, the clock wasn't on. And then I went outside the house and I looked around and there was no street lights whatsoever. There was not a car on the road. I stood still in the middle of an open space just to listen. 
Can I hear anything? Couldn't even hear a bird chirping. Couldn't hear a bat flying. Couldn't hear nothing. And I'd recently come to faith in Christ, so I knew at some point there's this thing where you know, God's going to come and believers are going to go and be with him and so on. And I remember walking over to a little chair and sitting down and going, I missed it. I missed it. What happens now? And I sat there for 20 minutes trying to work out, okay, so what do I do now? I've seen movies, I cut your head off and all this. Well, what do you do now? I don't know what to do, God. And I'm sitting there thinking, where, where did I miss it? I mean, I put my faith in you. What didn't I do? And I pray enough, did I not? And I went through all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, after about 20 minutes, I heard this car. And then I went out in the street and stood there and then looked around. And then suddenly, I don't know why it didn't dawn on me to start with, suddenly I realized there's been a blackout in the whole town, you dummy. And it's 2 o'clock in the morning and everyone's asleep, you know? So anyway, thankfully I did not miss it. I'm, I'm still here. And if I did miss it, here's the bad news. You all missed it too. But can you imagine, this, this guy comes in and this is, this is, their, this, this is one of their uh, early interactions with the prophetic. Who's ever been hurt by the prophetic? Who's ever had a, 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 a bad experience in the area of the prophetic, whether it be a prophetic word that was given to you, whether it be the way a prophet spoke to you, uh, somebody called a prophet spoke to you. Anyone ever had bad experiences with the prophetic? Three of us, again, wow, the rest of you guys, I, I want to live where you're living. Give me your address, give me your shoes, I want to walk in them. A lot of people have had bad experiences with the prophetic. And when you have a bad experience with that, it, it can be with anything. You can have a bad experience with the gift of healing. You can have a bad experience with the, the, the gift of tongues. You can have a bad experience with uh, someone who claims to be an apostle and the way they rule over. Like We can have bad experiences with all these great and good God-given gifts and blessings that are there for the church, but we can have bad experiences with them. We need to be very careful that we get our theology from this collection of ancient documents and the character and the nature and the word of God, not from our experiences, amen? Not from our bad experiences. And unfortunately, many of us have bad experiences with certain things to do with God or things to do with uh, the gifts of, of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit and different manifestations. Things. We have bad experiences and what we tend to do is we shun ourselves off to any of that ever being real or the possibility of any of those things being an actual blessing in our life. And in doing so, we, what we do is we effectively quench the Holy Spirit in our own lives and we cut off some of the good things that he wants to bring into our world. So I understand why the Thessalonians... We're, we're a little bit standoffish here. If you read the Corinthian letters, Paul's writing to a bunch of, of, of people in the Corinthian church and he's saying to them with all these spiritual things, he's saying, hey, you people need to calm down. Calm down a little bit. Let's get a bit of... And the Thessalonians, he's doing the other thing. He's going, you people probably need to ramp it up a little bit here. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. And the way that they were quenching the Holy Spirit, he's saying here, is that you're despising the prophetic. So what I want to do is ask the question, how do we handle prophecy in such a way that we don't quench the Holy Spirit? Now, very quickly, firstly, I want to just speak to those of us in this room that feel like either you feel like either you are a prophet or you know that you move in the gift of prophecy. Now, when I, when I speak of, of the, the spiritual gift of prophecy, I'm not breaking this all down today, so I'm just throwing some thoughts out there to us. Uh, there'll be a lot of holes in this, uh, but I'm not here to speak about spiritual gifts. I want to get to how we handle it in our own worlds. I just want to lay a bit of a base, a bit of a foundation. So if you're the kind of person that moves in those communication gifts, which could be word of wisdom, word of knowledge, I don't necessarily think that in 1 Corinthians uh, 12 that Paul is trying to give a name to all the gifts so much as he's explaining things that are happening. Right? He's explaining this thing's happening and we'll give it a tagline. I don't necessarily think God's sitting up there going, it has to be called this, it's called a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. No, I don't think that's really the point. The point is these things are happening and so Paul takes a snapshot of some of the things that were getting out of control in the context of the Corinthian church. I also don't believe there are only nine um, gifts of the Spirit. Again, I just think he's taking a snapshot of what's predominantly going on there. I mean, if God can say, let there be in their ears, if God can create mountains and rivers and oceans and the human eyeball and help give us the knowledge to get a human being to space and put stars and everything up there and then go, oh, I can only come up with nine gifts. I don't know what else to do here doesn't kind of fit the creativity of God. So I don't think that the Bible is necessarily giving us this is all there is. I think it's just an expression of these are some of the types of things when the Holy Spirit comes into our world and as Jesus said, that, that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke this concerning the what? The Holy Spirit. So there's a sense in which the Spirit comes into us, but that Spirit's going to flow out of you in some way and be a blessing to other people. And these gifts of the Spirit are some of the ways that that Spirit flows back out of us to be a blessing to those around us and to try to reach the world for Jesus. 
So if you are somebody that operates in these things, number one, just understand the, the potential impact that your communication can have on other people. A lot of people are hurt by, by things such as prophecy and we would say words of knowledge. When, 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 when people walk up, and, and there's a lot of power that you will when you say God said. Who knows that? And, and, and you've got to understand that, that there have been a lot of people that have been hurt early in their Christian journey because some more mature believer, I'm sure with a good heart, but no wisdom, walked up to them and said, God's telling you. And, and that person, I remember, you know, mind if I share a story? My wife may not be here with me today had she been not surrounded by some wise people to help her. When we were doing, uh, I was doing a school of evangelism with Youth of the Mission many years ago and Jackie had joined YWAM and she was doing a discipleship training school. And during this period, one of the guys that was a good mate of mine, his name was Frank. And Frank was, a, 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 I think he was like a Cherokee Indian from America. And Frank was over here and so on. And, and I know this was true because Frank would tell me, because we were mates, and uh, he, was, he went up to Jackie, who had only just given her life to Jesus and was still trying to work it all out. And this guy goes up <coughs> to Jackie and goes, the Lord spoke to me and told me you're going to marry me. Oh. She hit the fan. <laughs> she hit the fan. And, and, and I understand that because I've seen it. But here's the thing, here's the thing. <coughs> she was angry at God, saying to God, this Christian thing is no different than the world God. Thinking, well, here's a spiritual guy, this must be how God does it. And, and she could very well have gone on and ended up marrying this guy because she loved God, wanted everything God had for her, and just went, okay, well, this must be the way it works. This spiritual guy told me we're going to get married, so that must be it. And then she got angry at God for that. It was not God, but the, the fact that she was angry at God, it shows me that she was just really hungry for God, hungry for the things of God, open and trusting and believing. And we've got to be very careful, any one of us, when we go up to somebody and we proclaim to say we're sharing with you, this is what God's... We've just got to be very wary that when you do, that be aware of the potential power and influence you have in that moment amen just be aware of it it's not to say don't do it i'm just saying we need to be aware when we do that 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 we're wielding a certain amount of power and influence and and assuming a certain amount of authority when we claim to be giving somebody something that we're saying came from god so we just need to be aware of that in in the old testament prophets who were people who, who spoke on behalf of god they could actually be killed for getting it wrong anyone aware of that Deuteronomy 18.20, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Uh, in the, <coughs> again, praise God that we are living in the age of grace, amen? Praise God for grace. I would probably be dead by now if it was not for the grace of God. But again, when we go back and we look at it, this is how serious God was about his word being presented to people, that he said, I want you to make sure, sit with it. Don't, don't, don't feel like, you know, I want you to understand the, the severity of what can go wrong if you claim to be speaking on my behalf and it's not me. <coughs> you can lead whole nations astray. So I'm going to hold you to an account. This is the way it worked with the prophets in the Old Testament. Now, this is really, really important because it just reminds us again of the power and the influence that we claim to yield when we say, oh, God's telling me, God told me, God's saying. We just need to be careful. I'm not saying don't do it. What I'm saying is respect that moment and respect what it is that you're doing and respect what it is that you're stepping into in that moment. And the other thing I want to say before I move into the other side of it is this. When we do present things to people, my suggestion is this. Speak in humility. Never go up to somebody and say, God said, or God told me to tell you. I always go up and say, I feel like God might be saying. Because at the end of the day, if this is a word for Jackie, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Jackie has to have the freedom to judge whether it's from God or not because it's for her. It's for her. Does that make sense? It's, it's a gift for her flowing through me to her. So I'm not going to go up and say, God said, I've determined that that's what God's saying and it's for me to determine, you just need to obey and do it doesn't work like that. No, 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 I feel like God might be saying, I just want to present to you, I, I, I feel like it's possible, and, but I'm giving it to you as a gift. I'm just a mailman. I'll give it to you, the mail, then I'm just turning around and walking away. You need to open it up, read it, and you need to make the decision. You're the one that decides whether this is God or not. Amen? So just a couple of things to, for those of you that, that, that work in those, uh, uh, operate in those areas or claim to be prophets or move in prophecy, whatever, just a couple of things for you to think about. Uh, and, and we... At the end of this morning, I want to do something. We're going to pray. I feel like the Holy Spirit, I feel like, see, I feel like the Holy Spirit was saying, 
I'd love to invite people up at the end of the day, and, and, and I want to pray over some people. I feel like uh, I feel like part of what's happening here in Arise. I, I, I feel like God wants to release some people into some of these gifts, the prophetic and and and, and so on. And so uh, I want to pray for people. I'm just letting you know now. At the end of our service, we're gonna we're gonna lay hands on some people and pray for some people. So that's kind of why uh, I'm, I'm giving a couple of little ground rules on the other side. If you're the person giving it, because I'm I'm believing that God's gonna start to release some people into some of this stuff because these gifts are good. They're important for the body of Christ. They're necessary and they function today. So I'm just letting you know. Okay. So, but back to Paul's message. Paul's message seems to be directed at the receivers, not the deliverers. So how do we handle prophecy without quenching the spirit from the end of receiving it? So I want to give you very quickly five simple little things that I would encourage you to do. If somebody comes up and says to you, here's a prophetic word or I feel like the Lord might be saying or whatever, here's some things, five simple steps that you can take just to help you process it in in a healthy way so that we're not quenching what the spirit may want to do in our lives and in our midst. Number one, don't despise it. Paul makes this very clear, don't despise prophecy. That word despise, it literally means to make of no account. It means to make it of no account. Don't make whatever someone's given to you straight away off the bat, it's of no account. It's not real. It's not true. The New Testament doesn't give us the option of making prophecy of no account. I'll give you two very simple reasons. Number one, because prophecy is actually mentioned as a gift of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.1 Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. About that. And in fact, in the original Greek, the word gifts is not there. It's, it's spirituals. Now, concerning spirituals, I don't want you to be ignorant. In other words, they are operations of the Holy Spirit through us. And Paul says it's really important that you're not ignorant about these things. It, it's a good thing that you have a basic knowledge and that you understand that God actually does move in some of these ways. And it is God. And it is God. And if you understood the pagan backgrounds that, that, that these guys came from and some of the ecstatic religious experiences they had in their culture, it would make a lot more sense. He's trying to re-educate them going, hey, don't, th- th- these things are real. Yes, I know they happen over there. They happen in the kingdom too, but there's a little bit of a difference to them. In verse 10, he goes on and he mentions prophecy as one of those gifts. He also mentions a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. They're all gifts where somebody is claiming to have heard something from God and they're speaking something that they believe came from God to another person and the thing is that those gifts serve a positive purpose in the body of Christ in in verse 7 he says but these manifestations of the spirit are given to each person for the profit of all in other words these manifestations these these gifts that God gives he's saying don't don't quench them why because they're actually a profit to the church they're a profit to the kingdom they're a profit to the world I know that you've probably all met prophets that you felt more, more like a loss amen I've been around prophets that felt more like a loss. But what he's saying here is it doesn't matter what my experience has been or what I've, what I've been through and so on. Somewhere in the mix that I've got to get to a point, if I don't want to quench the spirit to understand, these gifts are good, they're given of God, and they're actually there to profit the body of Christ. They're there to profit the world and, and, and profit the kingdom of God and what God is trying to do in this place. The second reason why uh, the New Testament doesn't give us any reason to dispute it is because uh, prophets still exist in the New Testament church. There are several prophets that are mentioned in the New Testament church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Paul writes this to the Ephesians. He says that he, being God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There is a, such a thing as a New Testament prophet and an Old Testament prophet, but their functions are slightly different. Paul says here, the New Testament prophet, your primary function is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's your primary function. It's not like in the Old Testament where your primary function is to hear from me and tell a bunch of people that do not have my spirit inside of them. Samuel turns up and goes, this is what God's saying, you're going to do it. And they all go, well, Samuel said, let's do it. It's not like that anymore because you have the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit will speak to you. The temple veil was torn in two. You have a personal relationship with God now. You don't need to go through a prophet or through a priest. But New Testament prophets do exist, but their function is slightly different. They're not, they're not, they're not there primarily to future tell your life. They're there to equip you for the work of ministry. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 14, Paul, uh, talking about uh, the differences in the different gifts, and one of the things, speaking specifically about prophecy, he says that, that he who prophesies brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. So he says that this, this spiritual gift of prophecy is not about telling the future. It's somehow the outworking or the, the, the fruit of this prophetic gift is it's going to bring edification, exhortation, and comfort to you. That's what it's going to do. 
Can you see there's a bit of a difference between them? But just because there's a slight difference in function, they're still very, very real. And I do believe that there are prophets who will come and do sort of future tell and so on. But the point I'm making here is it's very different because in the old covenant, everybody did not have the Spirit of God inside them. They weren't hearing from God individually themselves. The prophets were telling them, here's what God's saying, here's what we're doing. And then the prophet would speak to the king. Here's what God says. And the nation would follow and do it. Now we all have a relationship with God and the spirit bears witness with our spirit on the inside of us. So I don't do anything just because a prophet said or just because someone comes and claims to give me a prophetic word. But I don't want to quench the spirit by just making it of no account. There's something in there that God has for me. In the New Testament, we've got Silas mentioned as a prophet. There's a guy called Judas Barsabbas, I think Acts 13, somewhere there. Uh, Agabus is mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament as a prophet. And it's very possible that Barnabas, who knows Barnabas, the son of encouragement? Very possible Barnabas was a prophet as well. Uh, I'm trying to remember where it was mentioned in Acts, but he talks about uh, that, that in the church, in, in wherever this was, that there were some prophets and teachers, and the first one mentioned is Barnabas. And it's interesting because the name Barnabas means son of encouragement. And the gift of prophecy in the New Testament is what? Edification, exhortation, and comfort. So it's quite possible that Barnabas was one. Whether he was or wasn't, the point is that the New Testament uh, writers tell us that there were still prophets in the New Testament. So we don't want to quench it by presuming that prophecy is of no account. Don't despise uh, prophecy. The second thing you do when you get a prophetic word is, is I'd encourage you to record it down. Write it down. It's a good habit to get into to write down. If, if somebody comes and says, look, I feel like the Lord's saying this. I don't know if you're like me, but you can come up to me and give me the most amazing word that you feel God is saying. And I can get excited and witness in my spirit and go, yeah, I feel like that's God. By the time I get in the car, I've forgotten all of it. I just forget things. So I've got myself into the habit of when, when people hear, I've had several people hear, so I feel like I've got a word for you, and, and, and I'll hear it, but then I'll say, I want you to write it down. Two reasons. Number one, I know I'll forget it if you don't, so would you help me and write it down for me? But the second thing is this too. I've also said in the past to people, if you really believe that's God, would you write it down for me and date it and just put your name there next to it? And it's amazing how many people at that point go, well, hang on a second, there's a little bit of accountability with this. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. And all of a sudden, that word's not as from God as what they originally felt it was. So I think it's a good habit to get into to say to people, look, either you write it down or say to that person, look, would you be prepared to write that word down for me? Uh, so record it so that we don't forget it. First Timothy 1.18, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made. What's he saying? You had some prophecies when? Previously. It's not something I'm giving you today. This has happened previously. He's saying, based on those prophecies that were previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare. In other words, whatever he talks, whatever he means by wage a good warfare, he's saying you need to... Remember them prophecies way back there? Now, if I was Timothy, I would have gone, oh, actually, no, I don't completely feel like... Can you remind me again, Paul? But didn't you write them down? No, I didn't write them So somehow there, somehow there, he's saying you've got to remember those prophecies because somewhere down the track, and I don't want to get into what he means by that, but down the track somewhere said you're going to need those words from God that have come into you, that have been given to you. You're going to need those to fight something that's coming later on here. So don't completely disregard it. Hang on to it. Record it. Write it down. Number three, test it. He says test it. Test all things. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There are lots of false prophets out in the world. Lots of people that, for them, prophecy is a way to get a platform. Give, give, giving you a, a word from God is a way to kind of get into your life and, and maybe elevate themselves. Oh, I'm really, that person's really spiritual and I'm all. And we've got to be careful of them. God judges the motivations of people's hearts. But if I'm receiving something from you, I'm still going to test it. I want to see where this thing is coming from to the best of my ability. To test means to scrutinize and to examine. In other words, don't take it all on board, no matter who says it to you. And how do I test it? Here's a couple of things I do. Does it line up with the revealed will of God through his word? Does it line up with the word of God? So I don't think God's going to give me something that's way outside the boundaries of the word of God. These, these are like train tracks for my life. And I don't think God's ever going to say to me, Alan, I want you to leave your wife. I just... I don't, just don't believe that. I'm not saying if, you're, if that's happened to you in life, I'm not judging, I'm not saying whatever, but what I am saying is, is that circumstances and situations may happen and that may happen to people, but I don't ever believe the Holy Spirit's going to come to me and say, she's, you need to get out of a relationship with her, she's bad. My wife loves the Lord. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. She loves me. I just don't believe this. I don't believe God's ever going to say to me, you know what, your kids, they're really annoying you. Just kill them. Just take them out. 
take them out and you'll have... God's never going to say that. You're safe, see? You, look, at all the little kids went, oh, see, I told you, mum. He's not going to say that. There are certain things that I know God is not going to take me outside the bounds of his word. So does it line up with the word of God? Secondly, does it line up with the revealed character and nature of God? God is a good God. God has a character and a nature. It, God's ways will change, but his character and nature will never change. He will always be who he is. It doesn't mean he operates the same. Doesn't mean, but, but what happens if you get healed over here and that person didn't get healed? God was good, faithful, just, and trustworthy over here, but he's good, faithful, just, and trustworthy over here. I don't understand everything. There's a mystery to God, but I know this. His character and his nature, I can lean on that, depend on that. It won't change. Does it line up with the character and nature of God? And the third thing I ask myself is this. Is this word confirmation or is it revelation? Is it confirmation of something? Remember, I have the Holy Spirit and he's speaking to me and he's leading me. Is this a confirmation of something I feel the Spirit's saying or is this completely left field out of the blue? Del, I just feel like the Lord's saying that when you go home today, sell everything you own, buy some chopsticks and move to China. (laughs) Now, is that witnessing with you, Del? Have you felt like the Lord's kind of leading you down that path? If he is, it was not God, I'm just saying. But you understand what I'm saying? When someone comes and gives me a word, I'm asking myself that question. Is this confirmation or is this revelation? In Acts 21, verse 10 to 14, Paul has an interesting situation. It says, And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the, Lord, thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him, don't go to Jerusalem. You hear what the prophet just said? He's going to bind your hand. Don't go to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we we ceased saying the will of the Lord be done. It almost sounds like the Holy Spirit saying, don't go. And Paul's going, digging his heels in, I'm going. That's just the way it is. I'm But if you go back one chapter, Acts chapter 20, verse 22 and 23, and see now, this is Paul, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. You see, when that word was delivered by Agabus, everyone around him went, oh, this is, this is revelation. Don't go, don't go. Paul's going, no, it's not. It's confirmation. The Spirit's already told me chains and stuff await me he's already told me what i'm walking into but i'm gonna i'm prepared to die for jesus christ if that's what it takes i'll walk into that anyway see the difference the the crowd around are saying no but paul's going it's not yours to judge it's mine to judge and i'm telling you now this is a confirmation of what the spirit has been saying to me thank you jesus thank you jesus is it confirmation or is it revelation if it's revelation then here's what i would suggest you do again Don't just chuck it. Maybe just put it on the shelf there. Just leave it because who knows? Maybe somewhere down the track you might get another one, another one, and you might start to see a bit of a flow and a bit of a picture. Sometimes you'll get a word and you'll just know straight away, won't you? That is just not God. That is just ridiculous, you know? Um, But if you don't get that major check in your spirit, I'd encourage you, just maybe just put that one on the shelf and just let it sit there for now. And if it's confirmation, then, then maybe you need to, to, to seek and think about, okay, what, what do I do with that now? Is it time to step into something? Is it time to do something? Uh, or, or where are we at? Number four, eat the meat but spit out the bones. Or a better way, throw out the bathwater but keep the baby. Anyone ever heard that term? Throw out the bathwater when it gets dirty, but you've got to keep the baby. There's always something good in there. First Thessalonians 5 21 and 22, test all things, hold fast to what is good. Why? Because it won't all be good. So hang on to the good. Hang on to the good. Remember this, when somebody gives you a word, who's giving it to you? It's a human being. It's God speaking through, a perfect God, but he uses imperfect vessels like you and me, doesn't he? And sometimes, the truth of the matter is, that sometimes we'll add a bit or we'll take away, and sometimes we put our own interpretation and spin on it and so on. It's just part of the journey and the process for us, especially when we're learning to step out in some of these gifts, especially when we're learning how to flow in some of this stuff. But always remember when you receive it, okay, it's a human being giving it to me. So I'm not expecting it to come across 100% totally perfect. Amen? Amen. I'm not expecting it to be pure and to... Look, there's going to be some nuances. That's why he says, you know, test it all. And he says, hold on to the good bits. Because there'll be some good bits in there. There might be a bit of flake and a bit of fruit. That's fine. Maybe the person got a bit excited because, oh, God's saying this to me. And and sometimes, oh, the Holy Spirit's using me and I'm excited. So I add a little bit. Look, that's okay. It doesn't make them evil. 
Most people are not evil. Most people are not wicked. We're just weak human beings. And, and, and when God chooses to use humans, he uses the whole human. The good bits, the bad bits, and otherwise. So be gracious, but uh, eat the meat, spit out the bones, or throw out the bathwater, but keep the baby. And the last one, depending on the nature of the word, seek godly counsel and confirmation. In Acts chapter 16, we've got this story of Paul and his missionary crew and they're heading off on missions trips and taking the gospel out to all the nations. <coughs> and they were heading in this direction and the Spirit, it says the Spirit forbade them, don't go there. So they started going here and then the Holy Spirit stopped them too. I love the fact that these guys just took initiative. They didn't sit in a, in a room waiting for a cloud to tell them everything to do. What should we have for breakfast this morning, Lord? Mm. No, no, no. Was just, you already told me to go into all the world and preach the gospel, so I'm going to go and do it. And as I'm doing it, you know, the proverb says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, not the intentions and thoughts. The steps, right? Put action to your faith. Take the word of God. Start living it out. And as you do, God directs your steps. And so that's what they're doing. And it says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night. And a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now watch this. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Concluding the Lord had called us. So I would say what's happened here is Paul's had this vision, and then he's, he's sat down with these guys, he's gone, I had this vision, here it is. And he submitted that, why? Well, because this change of direction was going to impact all them too, wasn't it? I mean, they were going to have to come with him. So he sat down and he said, look, here's what I'm feeling, here's the vision I had, so on. And together we concluded, this is God's direction for us. Yeah, sometimes a word's going to come into your life and it's going to have very, very little impact on your world, isn't it? I feel like the Lord wants to tell you today that he loves you or I just feel like God wants to say to you, uh, you, you're doing great. Or, you know, sometimes these things will come, edify, exhort, encourage, and there's very little. But every now and then, a word will come. And, and the way I look at it is this, the, 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 the degree of change and consequence and impact this word could have on my life is the degree to which I'm going to check and balance that word. Does that make sense? Someone comes to me this morning and says, I believe the Lord's saying to you, Alan, your time at Arise is up. You need to go and plant a church somewhere else. I'm going to be sitting down with some wise, godly people, and I'm going to go, okay, look, I've got this word. It's not, I'm not feeling anything about it now, but I just want to submit to you and just let you know this is what, you know. And if that comes again, well, then I'm going to sit down with them and so on, and, and we'll probably spend some time praying and asking God and so on about that as well. We want to, we want to uh, submit these things to God, and we want to think about these things. One of the ways that we quench the Spirit is that we don't handle the prophetic well. And what I want to do now is I'm just going to get... Uh, where's Nick? Is Nick here? Nick, do you want to jump up on the guitar for us, mate? Listen, we've gone a little bit longer than we, we normally do, and everybody that's here every week would know that. That's okay. Had a few things we wanted to get through this morning. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, I want to finish up with this. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Paul actually says this to the Corinthian church, right? He says, Pursue love... It's interesting that 1 Corinthians 12 is all about the gifts of the Spirit. And again, 1 Corinthians 14, he picks it up again, gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, we think he's talking about a marriage. Love is this, love is that, love is that. We pluck it out and we say it at weddings and things like that. Yet it's actually speaking about spiritual gifts. It's all part of the one discourse. Love. He says, love is this, love is that. He talks about the clang and gong and a symbol and so on. You just, if it's not coming out of a motivation of love, he said, I don't care what gifts or manifestations you have. I don't care what's flowing out of your world. If your motivation is not love, and he's so uh, set on that and thinks that's so important that he slips 1 Corinthians 13, smack bang, right in the middle of 12 and 14. And he says here, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. That word desire literally means covet earnestly, be jealous over. There's something about the supernatural gifts of God. There's something about that living water flowing out of us into the lives of the people around us. And I'm not just talking about other believers in this room. See, I believe that these things need to be flowing out of us, not just one hour on a Sunday morning. This should be part of our life because we live life with the Holy Spirit. We don't just come to church on Sunday and clock into spiritual mode. While there's a world out there of people that are hurting and that are lost and that are longing for something more than the life they've got. Many, many years ago, I, 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 went to, I was living in Brisbane and there was this thing called the Spirit Soul Body Festival. And I was taking an outreach team of young kids from all around the world. We got together and we went to this festival and we were going to set up a tent and we were going to be praying 
Basically, we were, we were doing this. We were going, let's set up a tent, like, and we're going to prophesy. We're going to, people come, we're just going to pray for them, wait on the Lord, and see what God might want to say and do. This was not a Christian gathering. This was a new age gathering in the convention center in Brisbane. I remember getting off the bus and going to the, to the young people there going, um, uh, I, 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 this was back before GPSs and jazz. And I, I, we, I parked the bus and I wasn't going to move it because getting a park in Brisbane is ridiculous. So I finally got one. I got out and I'm going, and they're all going to me. Well, where is it? I'm going, well, look, I thought it was here, but it's not. And here's what I said to them. I said, don't worry about it. Look for the bunch of hippies and we'll just follow the hippies. Because that soothes into all this sort of spiritual stuff, isn't it? You know? Well, anyway. I couldn't find a trail of hippies. So I'm walking around a bit, and then I did see a bit of a group there. And So anyway, I followed the groups. Eventually, we get to the convention center. We go into the convention center. We spent three days in there with this tent, just, just praying. If you wanted healing, we're going to pray for you. You, 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 you. you wanted direction. Next to us was a clairvoyant. And, and the lineup for that clairvoyant, people were lining up for two hours, standing in a line for two hours to sit down with somebody that was going to try to give them a word, connect them with something. Now, here's the thing. It spoke to me of the, of, of the desire and hunger inside man. We want something more than just... People don't want to just come to Jesus and just think that life is totally normal. God does nothing in your life. And this is unfortunately sometimes what it looks like. God makes no difference in your life. You just tack Jesus on. When you die, you'll get to heaven. But yet, when I read about the Holy Spirit and His presence and the gifts and the power of God and, and the different things that God wants to do and Jesus saying that out of your belly, your belly, your belly, your belly will flow rivers of living water and this He spoke of the Holy Spirit. When I, when, I, when I think about the life of the early church, when I think about the impact they made in the world, it all comes back to their relationship and their willingness to step out and to trust the Holy Spirit and to put themselves in positions where that's, that living water could actually flow out of them. Amen. It wasn't the hippies. It was mum and dad and the kids. And what saddened me was this. I watched people walk in. They walked in normal. And I saw people with my own eyes run out after going up the back to this spiritual healing tent or something. Run out screaming in fear and talking to demon spirits. And if, if you're not, a, I, I'm not trying to be weird, but I'm saying they're running out there. I watched them walk in normal. And they run out and they were screaming, leave me alone, grabbing their ears. Because they'd opened themselves up to this spiritual stuff that wasn't of God. Yet here we are with the Holy Spirit in us. And God wants to move through His church in supernatural and spiritual ways as well. Because the world is hungering for genuine spiritual encounter. What I want to do now is, look, we're officially over. Okay? I want to say thank you so much for coming uh, uh, along and gathering with us this morning, even if you got here by accident. Um, I'm glad you had the accident. I'm glad you came. What we're going to do now is I just want to open up the front. I want to pray for people. I just felt this morning that the Holy Spirit said, let's not just talk about this. Let, let, let's lay hands. Let's pray for people this morning. That, 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 that the Spirit of God would begin to stir up in your heart. You would begin to, to uh, trust God and to step out and start to believe that God wants to do these things through you in this place this morning. God wants to activate His gifts. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for people this morning. If you need to go, God bless you. It's been great having you. There's tea and coffee up the back. You don't have to leave. Uh, grab a tea, grab a coffee, have a chat with someone. We've got some morning tea. Where's that, Dale? Yep. Up the back. Morning tea up the back there too. Help yourselves. Just respect the space if anybody wants to come up and pray. If you don't want to come forward, to be prayed for, that's fine. Maybe your faith's at the place of turning to the person next to you that brought you and saying, look, would you pray for me? That's okay. There's nothing magical about our hands. It's God. And if you want to stay there, and, and, and but God's speaking to you, don't just ignore that. Don't quench the Spirit right now if He's speaking to your heart. Turn to the person next to you and just say, look, would you pray for me? Or can I pray for you? And let's just give the Holy Spirit that little bit of space in your life to do what he wants to do. I'm going to pray for us very quickly and then I'm going to invite people forward and you can have your tea, coffee, leave, whatever it is that you need to do. So Father, I want to thank you for this morning. God, thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place right now. God, I want to thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are resident in us. Lord, for many people, maybe they're lying dormant. Maybe we've had bad experiences, bad encounters. Lord, maybe we have uh, just decided to run a mile from it. Maybe, maybe we're convinced that the, the gifts, all this stuff's over, that are finished at some point, Lord. It's not, it's not what I see in the Word of God. It's not what I see in these ancient documents, but maybe there are people here that do, God, whatever the situation may be. Father, I just pray, would you begin to stir up in your people, God. Stir up that supernatural stuff, God. Begin to stir up the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because, Lord, we're not going to reach our community. We're not going to reach the world by just talking to them, God. Father, we need 
the power of the Holy Spirit, just as the disciples did. Lord, you told your disciples, don't go anywhere. Don't do anything until you get the Holy Spirit and you start to move in the power and the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. And Lord, we have the Spirit. I know we do. But for different reasons, Father, we just don't step out in it. So I just pray this morning, Lord, would you speak to people, God? And would you release stuff in our lives? And Father, for uh, Lord, those of us that need to walk out the door right now, God, I just pray. Father, in the next seven days, would you give every single one of us in this room, in the next seven days, would you give us an opportunity to tell somebody about God? Give us an opportunity to show the goodness of God to somebody out there right now that doesn't know it, that hasn't experienced it, that doesn't realize what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago, that you did it for them. Give us the chance to speak to those people this week, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys.